how much of our work day for someone that works nine to five, do you think we're actually focused? Like where we're actually doing deep work that's productive for an average person that's like working eight hours a day. Like how much of it do you think is actually productive? So I went to see a really fascinating experiment in New Zealand, partly based around figuring that out, but just to say about what you just said about this study. So this is a study by Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon that found exactly what you show. If you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus that you had before you were interrupted. But loads of us never get 23 minutes spare. So we're constantly operating at this diminished level of brain power. You know, the, even think about even the people at the top, the average Fortune 500 CEO only gets 26 minutes to himself a day, right? So what we're losing is depth. I'm in Miami, but I'm currently in Medellin, Colombia right now. Oh, <laughs> two places I love. I was actually just in Miami. How funny. I was in Miami like oh, two no weeks way. ago. Yeah. Were you there what for you... the hackathon or whatever? Or Hack, Hack Week, I think as well? No, no, I was no, just, no. Um, I was there to go on Tucker Carlson's show, actually. Oh, um, no way. Yeah. Um, but, um, and to go on this other show called Valuetainment. But uh, what are you doing in Medellin? Uh, well, I've used to live here before, actually. So I'm just here for a couple of months and working remotely. Um, I run like a language learning app on the side. So this is my kind of, uh, I am able to do this remotely and work pretty much from wherever at this point. So, um, but yeah, I love Colombia in general. Just the vibe here and everything is it's amazing. It's a great fucking country. What a great yeah. country. I, I really, I just read an incredible Colombian novel. What's it called? Reputations. There it is. Mm. Yeah. Um, have you ever read? He's a very popular young Canadian, well, relatively young, he must be my age, Colombian yeah. novelist called Juan Vasquez. Have you come across him? Maybe if I, if I see one of his book titles or, or yeah. covers, that I'm more, more visual memory. Terrible with names, but in general. I um, love Colombia. It's such a great country. So you've been to Medellin? Many times. Yeah. I spent, um, yeah, when I was working on my book about the war on drugs, I. Um, but it's funny, I, I'm one of the, perhaps the weirdest friendship I have is with Pablo Escobar's son, who used to be called Pablo what? Escobar Jr., but for obvious reasons, no longer uses that name. He's, he's now called Sebastian Marroquin. And um, he's not allowed to go back to Colombia, actually, but I associate him in my head with Medellin, because Medellin, I did a lot of research there. But he, um, first time I ever met him was in a, in, a, <laughs> in a Burger King in Buenos Aires. He wanted to meet me next to the children's play area. And it was so weird because he looked so much like his dad. That it was like a Whoa. weird stress dream where you're in a play area in Burger King in Argentina and Pablo Escobar walks in. It was like the most bizarre. Yeah, he's a great person. One of the smartest people I know. Really impressive. He must get recognized, right? Even if it's despite the name. I mean, if given he looks so much alike, like him. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes is the answer to that question. Yeah. But oh, you should my God. A request. He's a really fascinating. If you want an intro to him, let me know. I love that. Yeah, that must be fascinating. I he don't wrote know, a book uh, called Pablo Escobar. His book is Pablo Escobar, Mi Padre. Which is like, okay, <laughs> gets to the point. <laughs> Did you just reach out to him or he reached out to you to talk about the book? We actually have the same, uh, we're both published in Spanish by Planeta. Yeah. And uh, so we were introduced by our publishers, actually, because I wrote this book about the war on drugs called Chasing the Scream. And he wrote this book about his dad <laughs> which obviously has some link to the war on drugs yes and, yes uh, yeah a little bit. Bit, of, bit of a role yeah. <laughs> he's really smart yeah wow no i'm fascinated yeah i'd love an intro that'd be amazing um right. but hey let's let's talk about okay. you now here i'm excited to talk to you about uh stolen focus obviously you've written many books before uh but you know i'm Fascinated, given, especially given you've spoken to 200, you know, over 200 leading experts, you've really delved into this topic and you talk about, you know, the 12 major forces that are stealing your focus in this book. Uh, and honestly, like, I'm sure you felt this as well. Like the older I get, the more I realize, like, obviously time is everything, but having time or having more of it doesn't really mean anything unless you're fully present and you're fully focused mm -hmm. in that moment. Um, talk to me a little bit about the journey of getting into writing this book, especially after you've written Lost Connections before. Yeah, I think you put that really well. I mean, you know, I wrote it for a personal reason, which is that 
I could feel my own attention was going to shit, right? <laughs> like with each year that yeah. passed, things that things that are so important to me that require deep focus, like like reading a book, watching a long movie, having deep conversations, were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. You know what I mean? Like I, I could still do them, but they were getting harder and harder. And I could see this happening to so many people around me, particularly the young people in my life who I love. And I want to figure out well, what's going on here, right? Is this really happening or is it just a kind of anecdote? If it is happening, why? And crucially, what can we do about it to get our brains back? So like you say, I went on this really big journey all over the world from Miami to Moscow to Melbourne. And I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on focus and attention. And I learned that there's actually scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or can make it worse. And loads of the factors that can make your attention worse have been hugely rising in recent years. So if your attention is getting worse, it's not just you, you're not imagining it. It's not your fault. This is happening to, to some degree to all of us. And crucially, your attention didn't collapse. It's been stolen from you. But I really like the way you set that up, Sean, about being present, because it was actually having an epiphany about that that led me to, to, to write the book. Do you mind if I just tell this story? Please, yes, I'd love to. So I've got a godson who I call Adam in the book, who <laughs> when he was nine, he developed this brief but very intense obsession with Elvis. I never discovered how he even discovered who Elvis was, but it was particularly cute because he didn't know that Elvis had become this cheesy Vegas cliche. So he, he was really sincerely trying to impersonate Elvis. I think he's probably the last human being who will ever try to sincerely impersonate Elvis. And every night when I would tuck him in, he got me to tell him the story of Elvis's life. And I tried to skip over the bit at the end where Elvis, you know, shits himself to death on the toilet. Yeah, yeah. And you'll figure that out when he's older. <laughs> exactly. I think you can learn that on Google. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember one night when I was tucking him in, I was telling him about Graceland, where Elvis lived. And he looked at me super intensely and he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I was like, sure. The way you are with nine-year-olds, because, you know, like in three days time, it'll be Legoland or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he said, no do you really promise one day you will take me to Graceland? And I said, I absolutely promise. And I didn't think of it again for 10 years until so many things had gone wrong. So he dropped out of school when he was 15. And by the time he was 19, he spent, this is not an exaggeration, almost all his waking hours alternating between his iPad and his iPhone in this kind of blur of WhatsApp, porn, YouTube, and it was like his mind was kind, kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat when nothing still or serious could touch him. And one day we were sitting on my sofa just behind where the laptop is. And all day I'd been trying to engage him in conversation, just nothing was working. And to be honest with you, Sean, I wasn't that much better, right? Like I was staring at my own devices and I was so uncomfortable. And I suddenly remembered this moment all those years before. And I said to him, hey, Let's go to Graceland. And he just looked at me completely blankly. He, was like, well, he didn't even remember this thing all those years right. before. And I was like, look, we need to break this numbing routine. Let's just get out of here. Let's go all over the South. But you have to promise me one thing, which is that if we go, you'll leave your phone in the hotel when we go out and about, because there's no point going if you're just going to stare at your phone. And I could see he really thought about it. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. And two or three weeks later, we, we flew from London to New Orleans, where we started. And a couple of weeks after that, we got to Graceland. And when you get to the gates of Graceland now, this is even before COVID, there's nobody to show you around uh, anymore. What happens is they hand you an iPad and you put in earbuds and the iPad shows you around. So it says, you know, go left, go right. It narrates the story of the room you're in. And in every room you go into, there's a representation of that room on the iPad. So what happens is everyone just walks around Graceland staring at their iPad, right? I'm getting sort of slightly irritated by this. I'm like, trying to make eye contact with someone to kind of go, well, this is funny. We're the people who traveled thousands of miles and actually looked at the place we came to. I couldn't really. And then we got to the jungle room, which is Elvis's favorite room in Graceland. It's full of fake plants. That's why it's called the jungle room. And there was a Canadian couple next to us. And the man turned to his wife and he said, honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And I laughed out loud. I thought he was kidding. Mm. And I turn and look and they're just swiping back and forth. She goes, yeah, wow. And I sort of leaned over and I said, hey, but sir, 
there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. It's called turning your head. Because look, we're actually in the jungle room, right? It's you don't much, have to look at it on your phone. Too much effort, man. <laughs> you don't have to look at it on your phone, right? We're there. We're actually here. And they looked at me like I was insane, possibly correctly, and backed away. And I turned to my godson to laugh about it. And he was standing in the corner, staring at Snapchat. Because from the minute we landed, he could not stop. And, and, I, and I kind of stormed up to him. I did that thing that is never a good idea with a teenager. I tried to grab the phone out of his hands. And I said, I know that you're, you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing that you will miss out. You're not present at your own life. You're not showing up to the events of your own existence. And he stormed off and I kind of wandered around Memphis on my own for the rest of the day. And then that night I found him in the Heartbreak Hotel where we were staying up the street. He was sitting by the pool looking at his phone and I went to him and I, I apologized. And, it, and he didn't look up from his phone. He kept scrolling, but he said, I know something's really wrong here, but I don't know what it is. And that was when I thought, you know, I've been thinking about writing about this for a long time. So I thought I need to investigate this. And I realized we had come away to get away from this problem of not being present. But this problem of not being present was everywhere. There was no escape from it because there was no, there was no clear air to get to, right? And that's when I thought, I need to figure out what the fuck is happening to us here. Mm, wow. So you went on this three-year journey, interviewed about 200 of the leading experts around this topic. Um, let's go into it. I mean, I, what I'm, what I'm really curious about, obviously our brains are, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't really evolved and we're still trying to understand what are the capacities of our brains and how it works. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly one thing that has changed is that external stimuli that has come with technology and social media and all of these notifications. Um, is that the main thing that is causing the rise of ADHD in children, the rise of us feeling anxiety, is it mainly that our brains have stayed the same, but now we have all of these external stimuli that our brains are just not used to coping with? I wouldn't put it quite like that. There's lots of things going on. There's a very yeah. broad range of factors. What you're saying is, is part of it, but so to give in a part that I think is very relevant to what you just said, I went to MIT to interview Professor Earl Miller, who's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. And he said to me, look, you've got to understand one thing about the human brain more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. This is a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not significantly changed in 40,000 years. It's not going to change on any time scale. We're going to see you can only think about one or two things at a time. But what's happened is we've fallen for a mass delusion. The average American teenager now believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. So what happens is scientists get people into labs, not just teenagers, older people, and they get them to think they're doing more than one thing at a time. And what they discover is always the same. You can't do more than one thing at a time. What you do is you juggle very rapidly between tasks. Your consciousness papers over it. You're not aware you're doing it. But it turns out this comes with a really big cost. The, the technical term for this is the switch cost effect. So when you try and do more than one thing at a time, you will do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You'll make more mistakes. You'll remember less of what you do. You'll be less creative. You know, and this, when I say that, it might sound like a small, I remember when Professor Miller said it to me, I thought, yeah, okay, that's true, but that's a small effect. This is a huge effect. If you receive just eight text messages an hour, which doesn't sound like very much, one study by, study by Professor Larry Rosen found that it lowers your brain power for the main thing you're trying to focus on by 30%, just eight text messages. Or think about wow. a different study, Hewlett Packard, the printer company who always calls paper jams in my experience, which maddens me. But they, they did a study, where, it's a small study, but it's backed by wider evidence. They got a scientist in to study their workforce. And the scientist splits their their workers into two groups. And the first group is told, do whatever your task is and you're not gonna be interrupted. And the second group is told, do whatever your task is, but you've got to answer a heavy load of email and phone calls. So pretty much how most of us live, right? Yeah. And then at the end of it, um, the IQ, the scientists tested the IQ of all the workers. The workers who have not been interrupted scored on average 10 IQ points higher than the workers who had been interrupted. To give you a sense of how big that is, yeah. if you and me got stoned together now, Sean, if we sat down together and smoked a fat spliff, 
our IQs would go down in the short term by five points, right? So being chronically distracted is twice as bad for your attention and focus in the short term as getting stoned. You'd be Damn. better off sitting at your desk, getting stoned and doing one thing at a time, <laughs> than sitting at your desk, not getting stoned and being constantly distracted. Now, to be clear, you'd be better off neither getting stoned nor being distracted, obviously. <laughs> right, right, but right. You think this is why Professor Miller, one of the reasons why Professor Miller said to me, we live in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation as the result of all these interruptions. And, you know, this is a huge effect on our lives. It's one of the factors that's playing out. Yeah, and you mentioned, I think, in the in the synopsis of the book that the average attention span of an average office worker working nine to five is around three minutes. So if we were to kind of go back to, let's say, the 1990s, where technology wasn't as advent as it is today, can we compare roughly like what that was before versus how much it has gone down today? Yeah, so that's a study. The three minutes figures from a study by Professor Gloria Marks, who I interviewed. She's at UC, UC Irvine. Um, so there's some issues around long-term comparisons with attention. So the, I, the, there's two ways we could know whether attention has got worse. The ideal, the gold standard would be if we say we go back 100 or 150 years, mm -hmm. if scientists had consistently given the same attention test you know, for a really long time to people. And there are some things that have been tested consistently over a really long time. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Scientists didn't gather that data. So we don't have that information. But we do have other information that I think does help us to reach a reasonable conclusion about this. So I'll give you an obvious example. At sleep. There's pretty strong evidence that we sleep 20% less than we did a century ago. That's what the National Sleep Foundation calculated. Children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. And we know, I know this is a bit of a no shit Sherlock insight, but we know that sleep is essential. You need eight hours sleep a night to be able to focus fully the next day. And there has been a collapse in that. 40% of Americans are chronically sleep deprived. Only 15% of us wake up feeling refreshed. So I interviewed lots of the leading experts on sleep in the world. And I remember Dr. Charles Seisler, who's at Harvard Medical School, where I interviewed him, who I mean, he's advised everyone from the US Secret Service to the Boston Red Sox on sleep. He said to me, even if nothing else had changed, except that we sleep so much less, that alone would lead to a really, would be causing a really significant attention crisis. And of course, as we all know, that's not the only thing that changed in the last hundred years. And it was really interesting to explore how and why sleep has so profoundly damaged our attention. There's lots of reasons and lots of evidence. If you stay awake for just 19 hours, which doesn't sound like very much, your attention degrades as much as if you had got legally drunk. And Dr. Seisler did this really interesting research where he gets people into brain scans and, and, and tired people. And what he discovered is when you're tired, you don't have to be that tired. You can appear to be awake. You can be looking around you as surely as you and I are looking around now, but whole parts of your brain kind of gone to sleep, right? This is why when we say I'm half asleep, turns out that's not a metaphor. And I wanted to understand why sleep is so important for attention. And there's many reasons, but one of the people who really helped me to understand this is a brilliant scientist called Professor Roxanne Prichard at the University of Minneapolis, who explained to me, look, when you're sleeping, your brain is repairing. It's healing itself. All the time you're awake, your brain is building up something called metabolic waste. She calls it brain cell poop, which I think is really helpful. It's building up throughout the day. And when you sleep, your brain is rinsed with a watery fluid, your cerebral spinal fluid channels open, and that brain cell poop is carried out of your brain down to your liver, where obviously eventually it exits your body. If you don't sleep, you don't repair. We think of sleep as a passive process, like oh, I'm doing nothing, I'll sleep when I'm dead, you know, we've also that. Um, actually, sleep is an incredibly active process in which your brain cleans and repairs itself. If you don't sleep, your brain doesn't repair, it can't function fully the next day. And, and your attention, many things suffer, but your attention is one of them. So you think about how we can make these long-term comparisons. One of them, for example, there's lots of others that we can go into, but one of them is around sleep and knowing, okay, we know there's robust evidence that sleep has got worse. We know if sleep gets worse, attention gets worse. So it's reasonable to infer attention has got worse. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, I mean, just the sleep idea of loan that we're getting 20% less sleep and that could mess up our attention or focus. I'm curious to know, like, 
knowing that there's like, I think there was quoted, like once you lose focus, 23 minutes is what it takes to actually get you back to that same level of focus levels. How much of our work day for someone that works nine to five, do you think we're actually focused? Like where we're actually doing deep work that's productive for an average person that's like working eight hours a day. Like how much of it do you think is actually productive? So I went to see a really fascinating experiment in New Zealand, partly based around figuring that out. But just to say about what you just said about this study. So this is a study by Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon that found exactly what you show. If you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus that you had before you were interrupted. But loads of us never get 23 minutes spare. So we're constantly mm. operating at this diminished level of brain power. You know, the, even think about even the people at the top, the average Fortune 500 CEO only gets 26 minutes to himself a day, right? Mm. So what we're losing is depth, reflection, the ability to think deeply. And that's where innovation comes from. That's where creativity comes from. That's where knowing who you are comes from, right? Um, so I think you're absolutely right. But it's interesting because that question you asked, Asking that question led to a really interesting discovery about a way to restore attention. There's a mm. man I interviewed and spent some time with called Andrew Barnes. He's a great guy. So Andrew worked in the financial sector in London in the 1980s. So if you picture those videos of guys, like men shouting at each other across the stock, stock market floor, yeah. sell, yeah. sell, okay, he was that dude, right? And in that world, he wouldn't use these words now, in that world, you were a wuss if you got to work later than 7.30 in the morning, and you were a pussy if you left before 7.30 p.m. So for half the year, Andrew never saw the sun because he would leave in the dark and he would get home in the dark. He didn't have a relationship with his kids. His marriage broke down. And Andrew, because he's a wise and good man, was smart enough to go like, this is not the life I want. So he quit. He went to Australia and New Zealand. And he became a hugely successful businessman there. One of the companies he owns is called Perpetual Guardian, which runs, administers wills and trusts, it employs 240 people. Mm. And one day Andrew was on a plane and he read a scientific study in a bit summarized in a business magazine that, that said that the average worker only focuses in an eight hour day for three hours a day. And he was like, huh, that's not a good, he, he always had this memory of, this time when he'd been working in London, he'd exhausted himself, it was not a good life. He said, well, that's a really shitty deal for the worker. They're sitting at their desk for eight hours a day, but they're only getting three hours done, that's not good for them. Also, that's a shitty deal for me. I'm paying them for eight hours a day and they're not, they're working for three hours a day. So he did a back of the paper calculation. He wondered if one of the reasons why they were so much less productive and so much more addicted to social media is because they were really tired. They were mm. overworking. So he decided to do an experiment. He phoned, he did a conference call with everyone who worked for the company. And he said, guys, I'm going to make a change. From now on, I'm going to pay you exactly the same, but you don't have to work five days a week. You only have to work four days a week. Mm. And everyone's like, what? Like his head of HR literally fell over, right? Everyone's like, what's the catch? He's like, there's no catch. We're going to try it for three months. Let's see if it works, right? So they gave themselves time to prepare. And I think it was, I think it was three months to prepare. And then they moved to a four day week. Some of them, uh, some of them took a four day week and some of them did a six hour day, five days a week, right? So it was up to them to decide how they did it. Sure. And I interviewed everyone who worked for the, in their offices in a town called Rotorua, which is a slightly weird town that smells of farts, but very nice place. And, <laughs> and people. this was also, <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a major yeah. drawback to a town in my view, if, if everywhere stinks of farts, but I mean, it would be helpful if you farted a lot, I thought, this would be the place to move because no one would be able to tell. But the um, so, and it was fascinating. This was also studied by the University of Auckland Business School. They achieved more in four, in four days than they had in five. Right, um, the, across the board, the indicators were extremely productive. People slept more. They spent less time on social media. They achieved much more at work. They were significantly less stressed. They had better lives. So they decided to after the three month experiment, they kept it going. And I remember when I first saw that and looked at the evidence from other lots of places in the world have done experiments with four day weeks, you know, um, Microsoft in Japan tried it and got a 40% increase in, in productivity. Um, Toyota in Sweden did it. They repaired 120% more in four days than they had in five, a really pretty good measure of productivity. Wow. And across the world, there've been similar results. But to be honest, when I first heard that, I thought, well, that just doesn't, how can that be? 
right? That doesn't sound right to me, right? It's a, it seemed too good to be true. And it only really fell into place for me when I went to interview Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, who's at Stanford University, who's an expert on organizational behavior, one of the leading experts in the world. And he said to me, look, it's, it's not hard to figure out. Ask any sports team, I know we're speaking a few days after the Super Bowl, do you want your team to walk onto the pitch exhausted, having worked 12 hour days for a week? Of course not. You want them walking onto this pitch, fresh, rested, up for the game. Why would it be any different with any other form of work, right? Of course, we're more productive when we're not exhausted, right? But it's a real challenge. I, I realized it was a challenge to my own sense of productivity. If I have a date like today, I will have done seven interviews, right? And I know I'm gonna to go to bed and I will be exhausted and there'll be a little Puritan bit of me that will be like, well, you've worked yourself to the point of exhaustion, well done, right? So even yeah. though intellectually, I know everything I just said to you is true, I will be better in my interviews tomorrow if I had done three interviews today. Why right? is that? Why, why, is that in, why is that so innate in our human psychology to, to do that? I don't it's understand It's not innate that. in our psychology. It, it, it's, it's not, it's, okay. It's part of it. It's a heritage of a particular set of ideas in Western society. They're actually relatively new. If you look at history, human history, it's only quite recent that humans actually began to think about it, think this way. If you read, like, there's a classic sociology book called The Protestant Work Ethic by, by Max Weber, which is about where these ideas came from. They're very recent. They're, they're invented in the 16th century, and then they're sort of accentuated as in industrialization begins in the, mm. the 18th and 19th centuries. But these are relatively recent ideas. Most humans didn't work themselves to the point of exhaustion because they knew that was a dumb idea, right? So actually, these are very recent ideas, although they're deep in your consciousness and mine, yeah. We, one of the things we've got to do is challenge our idea of productivity in all sorts of ways. Loads of things that we, it's one of the things I learned in writing Stolen Focus. So many of the things we think are good are bad. And so many of the things we think are bad are good. Think about daydreaming, right? What do kids get told off for at school? Daydreaming. Turns out daydreaming is one of the most important and valuable forms of thinking. When I started to get my attention back, it's one of the things that was most valuable. You know, it's when your mind is wondering that you're processing your past you're anticipating the future and you're seeing connections between different things, right? Mm. It's hugely important. It's one of the things we've most lost in this environment where we're constantly switching. What was that on Facebook? What did Sean just ask me? What's on the TV over there? Oh shit, I've got a message on WhatsApp. Oh no, I forgot to message someone on, you can just see we're jammed up. Yeah. So, so many of the things we think the person who's glued to their desk stays until lights are put out in the office is the most productive worker actually they're not the worker you want, right? Mm. They're the ones who will be least creative, most exhausted. Um, and I just wanna say one other thing about Andrew's experiment, the one they did at Perpetual Guardian, because there's one way in which I think that story can leave people with a slightly misleading impression. So I think a lot of people hearing that will think, wow, I'd love to have a four day week. And a lot of people will think, God, I wish my boss was as enlightened as Andrew. And Andrew is a wonderful and unusually enlightened boss, but truthfully, I don't think that we'll get to a four day week by bosses having an enlightenment, right? That some people will be as great as Andrew, but most people won't. The way we'll get to it will be if we fight together for it. And for all of the causes that I write about in Stolen Focus, these 12 factors that are damaging our attention, for each of them, there's sort of two ways we've got to tackle this. I think of them as defense and offense, right? There are all sorts of things we can do to defend ourselves and our kids at an individual level from the factors that are harming our attention. But I wanna be honest with people that will only get you so far because at the moment it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all day and then going, hey buddy, you might wanna learn how to meditate then you wouldn't scratch so much. And you wanna go, fuck you, I'll learn to meditate, that's really good, but we need to stop you pouring itching powder on us, right? And yeah. if you think about, we have employers who exhaust us most of the time. And the main way we're gonna deal with that is stress again, some of them will be enlightened like Andrew. And if you can get an enlightened boss, great. But the way we'll get to these better solutions mostly is we're gonna have to fight together for them. You know, the weekend was not a standard thing until workers fought for it in the 19th century. It used to be workers were made to go six or seven days a week. Then workers fought and fought and the police beat the shit out of them and they got fired and they fought for years and then we got the weekend, right? Mm. And I think to get to a four day week or a lot of the other solutions like regulating big tech, regulating the food industry, a lot of other things we have to do, we're gonna have to come together and, and fight for them. I argue that just like we needed and need a feminist movement 
for women to reclaim their bodies and their lives. We need an attention movement to reclaim our minds to deal with these big factors. Yeah, I know it's fascinating. I actually read an article quite recently about this idea of like where the five day work week came about. And I believe we had like a six day work week in the past, but at least in America, and quote me if I'm wrong, is like the American factories were catering towards the Sabbath for, for Jewish workers. And they sh- decided to shut down for Saturday. And then I think Henry Ford kind of picked it up. And it's fascinating because uh, one of the economists, I think Keynes, I believe, he predicted something like the fact that by 2020, he predicted like 1920s. And he said 100 years from now, we'll be only working 15 hours a week because of the fact that we have so much leverage using automation, technology, and code. Um, so like in some sense, like, shouldn't we be teaching workers and society to better leverage existing tools that allows them to have more leverage and work smarter instead of just, just harder in some sense, because we now have a lot of tools that are available to us. Yeah. But what Kate Keane's got wrong, and it's a f- famous and brilliant essay and he's an unbelievably good writer, Keynes, uh, quite apart from being a genius economist, obviously is, yeah. um, what Keynes got wrong is employers in a in a hyper capitalist unregulated system will bank the gains in productivity and just demand more from the worker so it's not that we need to teach workers how to use the tools better workers know how to use the tools what we need to teach workers to do is organize band together into labor unions and demand a better life i'll give you an example of a place that did that so in with it relates particularly to attention that i write about in the book so in 2018, France was having a huge crisis of what they called le burnout, which I know you do translation apps. I don't think we need one for that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the French government, under pressure from labor unions, really important to understand this would never have happened if labor unions hadn't, if workers in France weren't organized and asserting their rights. The labor unions put pressure on the government and to, to set up a government inquiry to figure out why people were getting so burned out. It was headed by Bruno Metling, who's the head of, Orange, which is their biggest, one of their biggest telecoms companies. So he looked at all the evidence and he discovered one of the key factors was that 35% of French workers felt they could never turn off their phones or stop checking their email because they could be messaged at any time of the day or night by their bosses. And if they didn't answer, they could be in trouble, right? So I can give those workers all the lovely self-help tips in the world about sleep more you know put the phone away lock it up you know that's not a lovely piece of advice to them that's a fucking taunt right they can't do it so the french government under pressure from labor unions identified this and so the labor unions proposed a solution that was then passed into law it's very simple it's called the right to disconnect every french worker has two legal rights your work hours have to be defined in your contract And unless you're paid overtime, you have the legal right to not check your phone or check your email after those work hours have passed. So I went to Paris to interview people about this. Before I was there, Rent-A-Kill had just been fined 70,000 euros for trying to get one of their workers to check his email an hour after he left work. Now you can see how that's a collective change that workers fought for together. It would never have happened if workers hadn't demanded it that frees people up to make these individual changes. So it's not the French workers had to be told, oh, here are the tools to make you more effective. They were being given a tool that was making them less effective. Their bosses were fucking exhausting them and messaging them all the time. So while there are certainly tools that people can adopt, and I obviously talk about dozens of things in Stolen Focus that people can do as isolated individuals, and I'm passionately in favor of them. We can discuss some of them if you like. Yeah, I also think we need this level of collective action no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I, yeah, I would love to go into kind of some of the actionable things people can do. I think we're fighting this battle of trillions of dollars coming in from social media giants like Facebook, where, you know, it is very difficult for people to be able to escape from it, you know, unless they have the willpower and the tools to do so. And given all the research that you've done and, and, and the people you've spoken to, let, I would love to go into some of the big things that I guess people can do today and what are some of the things that are stealing our focus that people can be more aware of? Yeah, Um, so I I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley interviewing people who designed key aspects of the world in which we now live and that obsesses our kids. And it was so fascinating to realize how much they hate and fear their own creations. You know, Dr. James Williams, an incredible man who was at the heart of Google 
was horrified by what they're doing, quit, and it became, I would argue, the leading philosopher of attention in the world. He had this key moment. He was speaking at a tech conference. And the conference is full of designers who are designing the things that everyone listening, you've used, right? And he said to them, if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're creating, put up your hand now. And not one of them put up their hand. And it's important to understand big tech wants us to think about this in a binary. Are you pro-tech or are you anti-tech, right? That is not the question. That is not the, because that makes you feel hopeless. Well, of course I'm pro-tech. I'm not going to join the Amish, right? Yeah. Of course I'm yeah. pro-tech. Yeah. That is a completely false binary. The question is not, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? The question is what tech designed for what goals according to whose benefit and interests, right? Because at the moment we have tech that is designed a very specific way, but it doesn't have to be designed that way. So this became clear to me. It was explained to me by lots of the people who've been at the heart of the machine. When you open, let's say anyone listening, if you open Facebook, TikTok, anything like that now, they start to make money in two ways. The first is really obvious. You see ads. Okay, we all know how that works. The second way is much more important. Everything you do on any of these apps is scanned and sorted by their AI algorithms. So let's say that you mention that you like, I don't know, Bette Midler, Donald Trump, and you tell your mom you just bought some diapers. Okay, I'll figure out if you're a man and you like Bette Midler, you're gay. No disrespect to the straight men who like Bette Midler, presumably there are some. <laughs> uh, if you're conservative, clearly you like Donald, if you like Donald Trump, clearly you're conservative. And if you're telling your mom you just bought diapers, okay, you've got a baby. They're building up tens of thousands of points of information about this to learn who you are. Now that's partly because they're selling that information to advertisers because you're not their customer, you're the product. They're mm. selling you to the advertisers, but also it's so that they can figure out who you are so they can hack the weaknesses in your attention and keep you scrolling. The more information they have about you, the more they can keep you scrolling. So this is how they make their money, right? So everything they do, all their algorithms, all their engineering power, all this genius in Silicon Valley is geared towards one thing, figuring out how do we get Sean to pick up his phone as often as possible and scroll as long as possible. That's it. Just like the head of KFC, all he cares about in his professional capacity is did Sean eat any KFC today, right? That's it. That, that, that's his sole concern. The sole concern of these companies is how often and how long did Sean scroll? That's it, right? This business model was called by Professor Shoshana Zuboff, who's a great person, um, surveillance capitalism, right? But what was so striking to me, and obviously that is invading our attention, right? It's designed to invade our attention. In fact, Sean Parker, one of the biggest initial investors in Facebook said, we designed Facebook to maximally invade people's attention. And we knew what we were doing and we did it anyway. God only knows what it's doing to our kids' brains. That's what they say. We now know we have leaked data from within Facebook showing they know they are destroying our collective and our political attention as well. They know, right? So that can feel very overwhelming when you hear it. You can sort of go, oh, fuck, are we trapped in the matrix then, right? But crucially, we can deal with this. And actually, in a very targeted way, we can have social media that isn't designed this way. And just before I explain how that would work, I think there's a historical analogy that will really help people to see it yeah. and that really helped me to get my head around it. So how old are you, Sean? 29. 29. So you, you won't remember this. This is before your time. But I just remember. Um, it used to be that when I was a kid, uh, people filled their cars with leaded gasoline. It was the standard form of gasoline in the United States and in Britain. And before my time, uh, people used to paint their homes with leaded paint. And then it was discovered that exposure to lead really fucks your brain and particularly damages children's ability to focus and pay attention. And this had actually been known about going all the way back to the 1920s, but the lead industry funded a kind of bullshit denialist fake science to pretend it wasn't the case. But what it meant, all this gasoline being burned with lead in it meant that the air was full of lead and it was really damaging children all over the world. So a group of moms all over the world banded together and said, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing a for-profit company to fuck up our kids' brains? They, they were probably a little bit less sweary than me, so they may not say fuck up, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's really important to notice what those mothers didn't demand. They didn't say, ban all paint. They didn't say, ban all petrol. 
The debate was not, are you pro-paint or anti-paint? Are you pro-gasoline or anti-gasoline? They said, let's ban the specific component in the paint and the gasoline that is fucking up our kids' brains. And they fought and they fought and it took a long time and they succeeded. You will have noticed there's no leaded paint anywhere anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no leaded gasoline anymore. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has calculated the average American child is three to five IQ points higher as a direct result of that, that fight, right? So you can see how this is a really good model for us. You identify something in the environment that's damaging people's attention, you band together, you fight for it, you get rid of it. I would argue this is a really tight model for what we can do with social media, because we don't want to ban social media, that would be insane and impossible and undesirable. We want to deal with the specific elements that harm our attention. So I spent a lot of time obviously thinking about, well, what is the equivalent to the lead in the lead paint, right? And one person who really helped me to understand it is Aza Raskin. And Aza is, he invented a key part of how the internet works it's called Infinite Scroll. His dad, Jeff Raskin, invented the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs. Wow. And Aza said to me, look, if you want to understand how to solve this bit of the crisis, the tech element, it's really simple ban the current business model, right? Just say a business model based on secretly surveilling you in order to figure out the weaknesses in your attention, hack them and sell that attention to the highest bidder. This is just inhuman. It's like lead in lead paint. No, ban it. And lots of other people said this to me. And I kept, it took me a long time to understand it because I kept saying, okay, what happens the day after we did that ban? Would I open Facebook and it would go, sorry, everyone, we've gone fishing. He said, of course not. What would happen is they would have to move to a different business model. And absolutely everyone listening pretty much will have an experience of the two alternative business models. One alternative business model is subscription. Okay, you all know how Netflix and HBO work. You pay a certain amount, you get access. Another alternative would be, think about the sewers. Before we had sewers, we had shit in the streets, people got cholera. So we all pay to maintain the sewers together. We all own the sewers together. You own the sewers in Miami. I own the sewers in London and Las Vegas, right? We own the sewers in the cities where we live. Just like we own the sewage pipes, we might want to own the information pipes because we're getting the equivalent of cholera for our attention. But whatever different model we choose of those two, the key thing to understand is that all the incentives change. At the moment, it's a business model where the only incentive is to make you scroll longer and longer and longer, right? Yeah. Because you're not the customer. But it, under subscription or public ownership, you become the customer, right? Suddenly, they're not going, how, how do we hack Sean to sell him to advertisers? They're going, what does Sean want? Oh, turns out Sean wants to be able to pay attention. Let's design it not to hack his attention, but heal his attention. Oh, Sean wants to meet up with his friends and look into them face to face rather than stare miserably through a screen. Oh, let's set Facebook up to facilitate that rather than to undermine it. That's not technologically difficult. You know, the people I met in Silicon Valley could design that in a day, right? It's easy. It's just that the incentives aren't there at the moment. And just like the lead industry was never going to just one day go, you know what, guys, I am. I think we've made enough money. Let's, let's just stop poisoning kids' brains, right? That's not how it works. They had to be made to do it. We have to make these companies do it. And it requires a shift in consciousness. We need to stop just blaming ourselves. And although individual chains are, changes are hugely important, I'm passionately in favor of them. We also need to realize we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can reclaim them if we want to. Yeah, yeah. And it reminds me of kind of the direction that I was hopeful of when uh, I think Jan, I forgot his last name, when he started WhatsApp, which is now owned by Facebook, unfortunately, but he wanted to keep it completely ad free. And even when venture capitalists were trying, trying to give him a lot of money, he made sure that that was part of his thesis. It was that he's not going to put ads on. And even today, I don't think, I think their whole model, at least what they were doing before they were bought by Facebook was to charge you a dollar a year which was basically the model that you're talking about. And a lot of people paid. Um, I think some people just 
you know, developing countries. I don't think they charge them. And it just worked out for everyone. And I don't know what it's the, the, the kind of the future now with Facebook, especially in the metaverse and what they're building over there. But <laughs> yeah, there are models out there that, that <laughs> can work, but um, it's it would be hard to shift, I think, you know, the billions of dollars that they're making, which is, I believe, like 99% of their revenue and, and ask them to give that up. It almost kind of requires a new entrant that builds up and, and goes beyond Facebook with a new model from day one. You know, uh, I think of it slightly differently. And lots of people I respect think what you just said, but it's funny just before I say that, when you mention the metaverse, it always reminds me of, for people who don't know, this is Facebook's emerging. They want us all to interact in virtual reality. Um, it really reminds me, there's a guy called Jaron Lanier, who's an incredible sort of Silicon Valley legend. He's a tech designer and sort of one of the most prominent dissidents in Silicon Valley. And he used to advise loads of dystopian movies like Minority Report about, he used to help them imagine like horrific future technologies that would be like a nightmarish future. And he said to me, I stopped working on those movies because I kept designing like the most horrific technology I could possibly imagine. And then loads of people in Silicon Valley would look at it and go, that's really cool, let's make that. And he was like, fucking hell, no, <laughs> this isn't what I meant. Um, <laughs> but Jaron, um, yeah, I think he's completely right about that. But in terms of whether it needs a, a kind of competitor, I'm all up for competitors to Facebook, but if they work on the same business model, which is the dominant business model at the moment, then it'll just have the same, you know, it, there'll be mild variants, but it'll have the same problem. The way I think about it is different. What we need is not a competitor, although there may be some value in competitors, and there is some value in competitors. Mm -hmm. What we need is a is a, a movement. And, and when people say, often people will say what you just said, completely understandably, and of course, it's something that I thought a lot. Oh, fuck, this is, these people are just really powerful. How are we ever going to take this on? I think about a few things in relation to that. Um, one is think about Australia. A year ago, the Australian Prime Minister, almost exactly a year ago, Scott Morrison, who is not someone I normally particularly like or support, um, he he dealt with it. He tried to deal with it and successfully dealt with a quite significant problem. So, as most people watching will know, um, the news media is just dying because advertising that used to go to you know the Washington Post or whatever now overwhelmingly goes to Facebook. So people see Washington Post news that the Washington Post gathered on Facebook, but the money goes to Facebook, not to the Washington Post. So it's killing the news industry. It's one of the things that's killing the news industry. So Scott Morrison, hugely to his credit, it's not something I would ever say about Scott Morrison in any other context, um, said to Facebook, look, you've got, to, um, you've got to start giving a share of your ad revenue to the news media. You're profiting from the news they gather. News gathering is essential for a democracy. You've got to give them money. And Facebook lost their shit. They cut Australia off from the news aspects of Facebook. They went absolutely crazy. And then quietly, they gave in. Because we're much more powerful than Facebook, right? Mm. And we can deal with these things. Dr. James Williams, who I mentioned before, he said to me, you know, the entire internet, sorry, the ax existed for 1.4 million years before anyone thought to put a handle on it. The entire <laughs> internet has existed for less than 10,000 days. Yes. We can deal with this shit, right? We can put yeah, it right. Yeah. And on so many of the factors that I write about in Stolen Focus, from the way we eat, which is profoundly damaging our focus and attention, to the stress we experience at work, a whole array of things, we can deal with these problems. These are relatively recent problems. We can deal with them if we want to, but we have to choose to deal with them because at the moment we're in a race, right? At the moment, to one side, you've got all these 12 factors that are invading our focus and attention, many of which are on course to become much more powerful if we don't act. Paul Graham, one of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley, said the world will be more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last 40, right? Think about how much more addictive TikTok is than Facebook. Imagine the next crack-like iteration of TikTok, right? So that's one side of the race. On the other side of the race, there's got to be a movement of all of us saying, no, no, you don't get to do this to us. Absolutely not. This is not a good life. A life where we can't focus, where we can't think deeply, where our children can't play outside. That is not a good life. We choose depth. We choose to be able to focus. We choose a better life than this. We can absolutely achieve these things, both individually and collectively, but we've got to fight for it, right? Because if we don't, if there isn't another side of the, to that race, 
they'll just fucking invade and hack us even more, right? Yeah. We, we've got to have another side to that race. Just got to say, Sean, I should go in about uh, five minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, 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 no worries. Yeah, why don't we wrap it up with some individual um, tips for people that could, they can do to regain back focus uh, or just things, whether it's things that they can avoid or things that they should do. You mentioned food and diet is one of them or technology tips that we can, we can implement into our daily lives. Sure. So I'll give you three quick ones. One is, you can't see it, but in the corner of the room there, I have something called a K-safe. It's a plastic safe. I swear I'm not being paid commission by these people, by the way. Their sales have really okay. got up since I started talking. But the, um, it's a plastic safe. I feel like a QVC person now. Um, you take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid, you turn the dial, and it'll lock your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I will not sit down with my boyfriend and watch a film unless we imprison our phone. Uh, I will not have my friends around for dinner unless they all put their phones in the phone jail. And um, it helps you get your focus back. Um, so that's one thing I would recommend. Another thing I would recommend is when I used to struggle to focus, I would go into a spiral of self-recrimination. I would go, oh, you fucking idiot. Why are you so, why don't you have the willpower? Replace that with something else, which is pursuing a flow state. So flow, flow states, everyone listening will have experienced a flow state. A flow state is when you're doing something that's, re that's important to you and you totally get into it. And your sense of time falls away, your sense of ego falls away. The way one rock climber put it is, when you're, in a, when you're in flow, it's like you are the rock you're climbing. And different people get into flow doing different things. For you, it might be playing the guitar, making bagels, doing brain surgery, whatever it is. For me, it's writing, right? So, and what's really interesting about flow is it's both the deepest form of attention that humans can provide, and once you get into it, it's the easiest form of attention to, to provide. It's not like, I don't know, learning facts for an exam where you're like, oh, fuck, what year did the Civil War begin, right? It's just it's not an effort. So obviously, I wanted to understand if this is a gusher of flow that exists inside all of us, where do we, if a gusher of deep focus, where do we drill to get that gusher, right? And so to understand this, I went to interview the leading expert in the world on flow states, an incredible man named Professor Mahali Cheeksent Mihai. You have no idea how long it took me to learn how to say that. Um, <laughs> pretty good. Who, who, I, got the, I think I did the last interview he ever did because sadly he died soon afterwards, which is a terrible loss, even though he was a, a very old man. And Professor Cheeksent Mihai um, discovered a huge number of things, but I think for the purposes of people listening, there are three things he learned that I think will really help if you want to get into a flow state. There's no guarantee, but this will maximize your chances. You've got to do three things. Firstly, you've got to, for a while, narrow down to one goal. If you're trying to do two, three, four things, you won't get into flow. Secondly, you've got to make sure that goal is meaningful to you, right? If you're trying to focus on something that isn't meaningful to you, it just doesn't work, right? Your attention slips and slides off things that aren't meaningful to you. And thirdly, it will really help if you choose um, a, a goal that is at the edge of your ability. So let's say you're a medium strength rock climber, medium talent rock climber. If you just try to climb over your garden wall, you're not going to get into flow. It's too easy. If you suddenly try to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, you're going to shit yourself. It's going to be too much. You want to choose a slightly higher and harder um, rock face than the one you climbed last time. So if you do these three things, so stop blaming yourself. Instead, narrow down to one goal, make sure it's meaningful to you, push yourself to the edge of your abilities, but not beyond them. You maximize your chances of getting into this deep sense of attention. And thirdly, I would say, think about the way you eat. Uh, and this is the one I, I've got to be honest with you. I struggle with most. There's literally a KFC bucket behind this thing. So <laughs> no, I you talking I'm, about KFC before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I can smell it. It's partly why it's in my head. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not the Dalai Lama here, right? The, <laughs> yeah. um, the, although the Dalai Lama did once call me fat. It's a long story. I'll tell you another time. But the, um, so yeah, the, the, um, I go through lots of ways in which the way we eat is profoundly damaging our focus. But I'll just give one example. Um, let's imagine you eat a standard American British breakfast. You have sugary cereal or white bread with butter on it. What that does is it releases a huge amount of energy really quickly into your brain. And it feels great. You're like, the day has begun, I'm ready. But because it's really so much energy so fast, what will happen is you'll get to your desk or your kid will get to their school desk and an hour or two later, you'll get a really big energy crash. And you'll get what's called brain fog, where you just can't focus until you have a load of caffeine or a sugary carby treat, right? As Dale Pinnock, one of Britain's leading nutritionists, explained to me, the way we eat puts us on a roller coaster 
of energy spikes and energy crashes throughout the day, which gives us these patches of brain fog. In fact, the way he put it is, it's like we're putting rocket fuel into a mini. You know, those little British cars from the 70s. It'll go really quickly and then it'll just stop, right? Oh, yeah. Whereas if you put in the fuel that we're we, we evolved to have, it'll go along nicely. So if, for example, you move from having a sugary cereal to having oatmeal or from having KFC to having oatmeal, then, you know, your attention, you, you'll experience less brain fog. You'll be able to pay attention more consistently. So obviously I go through dozens and dozens more things in the book, uh, both yes. that we can do as individuals and that we can do collectively to get our attention back. But those are just three that came into my head straight away. No, that's great. That's great. Well, I know you have to go. So I highly recommend people check out Stolen Focus, Lost Connections, which is the previous book for that. Where can people learn more about you, Johan, and uh, go deeper? You know, it's funny. I got in trouble at, at a podcast a while back because um, at the end, the guy said to me, so I'll just say my website, so I'll tell you what I said to him. So if you want to get, uh, so stolenfocusbook.com shows you where you can get the audio book, the ebook, or the physical book. My publishers tell me I meant to say you can get it from any good bookstore, but I always feel like saying you can also get it from shitty bookstores. It's not like we have like a quality <laughs> test where they're like, no, you're not a good enough bookstore. You can't like have that. it. Yeah, exactly. Um, my previous book, uh, you can go to lostconnectionsbook.com um, uh, or you can just go to my website. It's J-O-H-A-N-N-H-A-R-I.com where you can see my TED Talks, all my books. Uh, you can watch the eight part TV series I made with Samuel L. Jackson and loads of other things. Um, but yeah, the thing that I got in trouble with is this guy said to me at the end of the interview, this guy was 50, which is relevant. He said, what's your Twitter? And I said it. And he said, what's your Instagram? And I said it. He said, what's your Facebook? And I said it. And they said, what's your Snapchat? And I said, I am a 43-year-old man, right? The only 43-year-old men on Snapchat are certainly pedophiles, right? Why would they be that otherwise? <laughs> And he didn't laugh at all. And because he didn't laugh, I tried to lead into the joke. And he said, I said, you know that show To Catch a Predator, where yeah, they catch yeah. pedophiles? The next season of To Catch a Predator should be literally, they just go to adult men in the street and say, what is your Snapchat handle? And if they have one, just immediately arrest them, right? <laughs> but this guy didn't laugh at all. I later looked him up. And he's a 50-year-old man who appears to be quite active on Snapchat. So I'm glad we got through this interview without me accidentally accusing you of being a pedophile. Um, That's so funny. But the, yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation, Sean. And I'm very jealous great. that you're in Medellin, which is uh, uh, one of my favorite places in the world. So I wish I was there with you. Well, let's keep in touch. Yeah, I'd love to, right. uh, love to keep the conversation going. But yeah, I really appreciate your time here, John. I had a great time. Uh, 